Well, welcome to Fort Knox. I'm here this time with Owen Tripp, uh, CEO of Included Health. Owen, great to have you. I like to jump right in and ask about the toughest problem that you're solving. Uh, I think med tech, health tech, integration of health is a, is a pretty big topic. How do you tackle it? What's the, what's the toughest problem? Access. Access. I mean, we have the greatest healthcare capabilities in this country when used properly. We have the best science. We have platforms for developing novel medications from doing surgeries that even just a couple of years ago would have been impossible. And yet we have people telling us that their outcomes are poor, that they can't get access to the appointments that they need, that for certain populations, when they get access to those appointments, they actually feel like the provider is not offering culturally concordant care or isn't equipped to treat whatever they need to do. And we see that as an information technology problem. We see it as a clinical problem as well, but we also think that when used properly, the American healthcare system is by far the best in the world. And so that's what we're working on. So I've talked to a number of CEOs here on Fort Knox who have different approaches to solving this. Um, Akili Hinson comes to mind, uh, Gina Bartesi over at Kind Body, now, yep. now chairwoman, not, not CEO, um, Adrian Aoun at Forward. What's included health app and, and unique approach to trying to solve this access problem? Yeah, so I know all those folks. Those are good friends. They inspire my work, and, and hopefully I, I give a little bit back to them as well. I think we take a pretty straightforward view of this, John, which is that when you talk to people about their best experiences in healthcare, it usually starts with access to a terrific provider that could be a doctor, it could be a nurse practitioner, it could be a psychologist, it could be a social worker, but somebody who takes a real interest in them and literally is in the business of taking away pain and suffering and is committed to a personalized form of care that really works. Now, that all sounds good. The scaling part of that equation is the really hard thing. And the reason that Included Health is used by over 30% of the Fortune 500, the reason that we have millions and millions of visits each year in the service lines that we're going to talk about today is because we've made that access part really straightforward. There's no guesswork about how to get access to a doctor 24 seven. There's no guesswork about being able to see the same team each visit so that you know that they're personally committed to you. And there's no guesswork about integrating the insurance coverage that all of us working Americans, you and I, John, and everybody else, about half the country gets our insurance through our employers, that all of us can find an integrated and super easy way to use that care. So you you asked about apps. Of course, we have the apps, right? We have the Apple app, we have the Android app. But really, when I think about the killer platform or the killer app that we're creating here, it's bringing all of those services together, virtual care, virtual concierge support to all of your insurance need, virtual financial support for everything uh, that you may encounter in your journey, connected to your real world experience. So whether you live in a rural county and you're 50 miles plus away from the nearest hospital or you're right here with me in the middle of San Francisco and surrounded by amazing places, that that experience can deliver a terrific out for you, outcome for you each time. And so we think of that really as where technology meets the real world and being able to scale an amazing experience like that. And there are others, maybe I should have mentioned, Aaron Bali, et cetera. If I didn't mention you, it's not because I don't think you were important, a med tech CEO. On Just talked to Aaron here. last week, love those guys. <laughs> this is a community, all those people you name checked are people that are really trying to change the fundamental experience. And I think that, you know, one thing, I'm guessing everybody who's watching this could readily agree to is that the experience of the average American healthcare consumer is not great. And frankly, it's not great for the providers either. And yet we've modernized the way that we experience just about everything else in our life. So those people that you mentioned, certainly me and my colleagues here at Included Health, we're pretty committed to making that experience absolutely worth bragging about. A lot of the people who fall through the cracks, it seems, are not full-time employees of a large employer that's offering uh, complicated and, and deep health plans. So what about that population, the gig worker population, the entrepreneur population? How do you solve that access problem? Yeah, well, you're right that those people may not have the most obvious set of benefits to utilize. But in a minute, I'm going to tell you why even the people who have the benefits aren't using the system properly. And that represents a huge challenge to all of us. But for those folks, the good news is that everything that we do at Included Health is actually available to consumers who want to come here 
uh, use great apps like Doctor On Demand, which revolutionized the video experience for telehealth, video experience for behavioral health. And we're really committed to making sure that we raise the standard of healthcare for everyone. That is our mission statement, and it is something that we live and breathe and uh, how we design our products here. But, but John, there's something interesting here. You know, you said, well, if you don't have access to those benefits, you might be surprised to know that nearly half of Americans who do have those benefits, and we're now talking about the 159 million people that are covered by their employer, still report that they don't know what their benefits are, they don't know how to use them, they don't know what's covered under those programs. Um, this, despite the fact that all of those same employers, yours and mine, report this as one of the largest expenses that they incur each year. Imagine going out and making a gigantic investment like health benefits and access to insurance and finding that people remain confused by the complexity. And when they are confused by that complexity, they just opt out entirely. And unfortunately, as you well, both know, when you opt out, bad things happen. Well, there's no standard app interface for health where, hey, I need to see a doctor or I'm concerned about this or that that has to do with my kid. When we look at um, more fluid and, and capitalistic marketplaces, like in e-commerce, standards, not through any kind of regulator or governing body, sort of developed over time. Amazon did some things around one click and menus, et cetera. Other people picked them up and any shopping website, you can pretty much pick it up, search through things, find what you need. There are certain expectations about free shipping and returns because they become part of the culture. But somehow, and I, I know you're going to tell me and tell us why in health that has not become the case. If there were just one app that no matter who my provider is, I could pick up and search through and tell what my problem is and then you know, solutions came at me and I could understand what, what's covered, then, you know, I'd probably, and when I'm saying I, I mean the audience, the population you're talking about would probably use it a lot more, right? Yeah. And we're in really early days on this. So let me, let me actually, I think I've got some good news for you on this topic, but, but we're at least a decade behind those very consumer friendly applications that we talked about. Uh, and maybe just sort of as quick background, my, when I first moved out to Silicon Valley, um, I, I work just down the road from your old employer. Uh, I work for PayPal and for eBay and PayPal. And so we went back and forth as those companies were integrating. And the real thrust of that business was to make sure that end to end experience from buying something and trusting that you could buy it online and that you could do the payment all in one place was the whole point of what we were trying to build with that business, an integrated platform. Now we can look at something like that and we say, of course, every even sort of a modest small shopkeeper can now stand up a site uh, and use those tools on an integrated basis. That doesn't exist in healthcare. We're way behind. Now, there's an economic reason why this is true. It's because American healthcare is the biggest industry of anything anywhere. We spend close to $4 trillion as a country. We get poor health outcomes in return. But what that gigantic ocean-sized market enables people to do is build really small, niche experiences within healthcare and still make a lot of money. And what we're turning the table on here at Included Health is saying all of that experience needs to be integrated. The same way we're now used to having reviews and payments and uh, shopping experiences and shipping and returns and all those sort of core features of an e-commerce site, the same way we get that all in one place, we need to get all of our healthcare experience in one place. We need to be able to review doctors. We need to be able to book appointments. We need to be able to understand what, understand what our insurance covers and how much is left on our deductible. We need to be able to get labs ordered. We need to be able to get care at home when we need care at home. We need to be able to get care in the hospital. We need care in the hospital. For the first time, at least to my knowledge, this is coming together on one single platform. And it won't surprise you to hear that the members love that. That's the experience they want. They don't want to overthink where they need to go, especially when they're not feeling physically well. So uh, tell me about Doctor On Demand. I mean, I, I've used it. I've um, spoken to previous leaders there, but uh, telehealth had a, a bit of a boom, similar again to e-commerce during the pandemic. And then there's been a normalizing since. So when it comes to that segment of the business in particular, where are we? What have we learned? And what's the next phase that we're heading into? Yeah, you're totally right. And, uh, you know, I don't know when you first 
connected up with Doctor On Demand. But you know, for a period of time, it was early adopters like you and me and all of our sort of tech uh, comfortable buddies who were really uh, experiencing these apps and experiencing the benefits of getting care from your home and not having to go into that sort of gross waiting room to to get the care we needed and, and frankly pay a lot less for a high quality doctor experience. Then came the pandemic. We all know what happened there. It became not just this nice to have, it became the only line to care that any of us actually had. And of course, during that time, our business went through the roof on urgent care, of course, but also things like behavioral health, primary care. Now, where this has really gone, John, and I think this is sort of interesting, is it's not so much that telehealth has come down. You can certainly read reporting that shows that on a percentage basis, the absolute number of visits have come down. That sort of makes sense as we exited the pandemic. But in fact, the real preference members have now is that they see the same medical teams between their in-person experience and their virtual experience, and that at a minimum, there's connectivity. And so my guess is for all of your viewers that many of their physician experiences, at least the follow-up experiences, those second, third, fourth visits will be virtual and that people will want a connect platform. And this is really interesting. This is a transition out of the classic hospital experience as we know and into a more accessible, more portable experience. It won't surprise you to hear, or maybe it will surprise you to hear, that over that same time frame, we've only increased our number of visits. So a lot of people have said, well, you must be coming down from your volume from the pandemic. Uh-uh. We've been increasing our volume steadily across all of those service lines since then. And we expect that trend to continue. This is clearly the way people prefer to access their care today. And yet there, there's something about it that is um, transactional in a way that our experience of, of the best care is not. Now, what I love about I started using it pre-pandemic and often it was stuff kids related where, you know, with a young kid, oftentimes you find yourself running off to urgent care for something that Middle might night. not require yeah. urgent. Yeah. If it's not bleeding or broken, even if you're not sure it's broken. Do you have boys or girls? Boys. <laughs> <laughs> probably your first step shouldn't be urgent care, but there you are driving 40 minutes to some place and sitting in a waiting room and then right. getting a bandage or something that you come home right. with three hours later. Uh, Doctor on Demand was great for that. Hey, have a look at have a look at his throat. Shine a light in there. The webcam. What do you think? Oh, okay, well it looks. Like, prescribe this and get it dropped. Up. Boy, that's a lot easier than the alternative. Um, but a, not everybody's got the equipment to do that in a comfortable way. And then B, um, a lot of people aren't used to that motion. Their their motion is let me go with who I trust, who I know or at least a place that I've been before, they're not thinking digitally. Has that particularly changed? It has changed, and it's probably changed in the most pronounced way in the least expected demographic. So everybody always thought it was going to be the younger demographic that wanted to uh, use Care That Way, Gen Z, Millennial. Um, in fact, it's sort of been the opposite. The Gen X, the boomers like to access this form of care, and they're preferring it given terrestrial alternatives. Now, that's a really interesting observation for us. And it probably tells us something about how people want to maintain care and how they find the traditional visit to the doctor's office, the parking, the waiting room, the endless charting, how they find that stressful. And that's an insight that we're really trying to run with. But I also want to highlight something else you said, because I think it's really important and maybe non-obvious to your viewers, which is that it did move from a transactional model, meaning I put a quarter in the jukebox, I get access to a doctor for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever it is, it can be any time, day or night, to I now want to see the same person and the same team over a regular basis. Now, that may actually seem straightforward to people, but to do it at the kind of scale that we do it with the quality we do it is actually a massive technological problem because you have to match people to state certifications. You have to match people to preferences. You have to match people to geography and schedule, but you can now schedule a doctor and have a continuous relationship. And I think this is really important to highlight to go into the medicine part of it for a half second, because that allows us actually to take care of a whole range of diseases and conditions that you wouldn't treat in urgent care. So let me give you a couple of examples. 
for many of our members, if their companies uh, uh, sort of organize this as part of their service, what we'll do is we'll send a connected scale, a connected blood pressure cuff, maybe a notoscope, you, which you referred to earlier, or any other tools that we think will be useful in the home. Now, with those sorts of sensors, plus the ones that we already all have, we can actually develop a picture of a member that allows us to deliver longitudinal care and flag events much more proactively. Now, doing that sort of data crunching at scale and using predictive models to figure out which members need to be reached out to or to be able to look at the member's data right with them at that moment, that's incredible. That's healthcare like I want it. I think it's probably healthcare like most people want it. Um, and it really transitions us out of this transactional model into a longitudinal form of care to treat things like chronic disease and many of the other major problems in our society today. All right. Yeah. Interesting. Um, well, I've, I've learned uh, some about included health. Now I want to learn some more about you. And I like to start at the very beginning. So tell me, uh, where were you born? Household, parents, siblings? Yeah. So I was born in Massachusetts uh, in the Boston area, and I am the son of a pediatrician. Uh, both of my parents were sort of heroes of mine. My mom was an educator. My dad was a pediatrician, um, and he was really a community doc. So he would get stopped in the church parking lot and people would, uh, while, while, the, while I didn't ever see anybody undress in the church parking lot, I sort of worried that that was going to be the next step as people talked about a variety of ailments, lesions, whatever, headaches. And, um, you know, he took care of those people and he took his job incredibly seriously. Uh, you know, my background as I got older was really in developing technology. And, you know, I was writing software when I was in college to teach people different languages, interactive models for coaching people. And I got really bit by the bug of developing uh, great software platforms. And, and that's sort of where this originally came from, or at least my love of software and data science and the models that underpin what we're up to now. And what areas your mom's focus in education? So she was a classroom teacher for a short period of time, but then she really got interested in leadership effectiveness. So she was a assistant to superintendent for a large school district focused on principals and other administrators and other leaders that really drove the effectiveness of the overall teaching product. Um, you know, my dad, as much as I love and admire him, uh, you know, his business was really about sort of one on one, right? It was one patient at a time taking care of that person and moving on. My mom really was the system thinker, is the system thinker. So she was thinking at scale about how you transform whole educational systems and communities. And um, it's a nice story, but I also think it's true that I was really influenced by both of their thinking in arriving to where I am today. I'm interested in doing things at scale, but I also understand that for every patient that we might encounter, that whatever is in front of them, whether it's a highly complex cancer diagnosis, we haven't yet talked about our specialty care, but we handle expert medical opinions and an elite network to support those people, whether it's something very complex like that or very straightforward, for that member, for that patient at that given moment, that is the most important thing. And they can't think about doing anything else until they solve that problem. So it's really those two schools of thought that influenced me. So we talked about, um, about what drove you toward technology. As we talk about siblings, that gets us into what drove you toward caring for people and, and health and perhaps mental health. Tell me about that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, sort of a sad story, which I actually don't share uh, a whole lot publicly. So I don't know if you were queued up on this or you just have a good instincts on it. But um, yeah, so I'm one of four, grew up in a boisterous family um, where we are and we're very close. Um, my younger brother, who I shared a bedroom with, um, you know, my entire childhood, took his own life when he was 18 years old. And I think the in retrospect, it's now um, a decade plus past on that. But in, rec in retrospect, thinking about that, you know, we didn't have an easy way to talk about mental health then. And so um, there, there certainly was uh, a, you know, you'll get through it sort of mentality. And I think that was true largely of where I grew up. I don't know if you relate to that at all, John, but, you know, the way I grew up is sort of um, a little bit of, you know, pick your head back up, get after it, you'll figure it out. Um, and while a little bit of that mentality can be healthy, it's not sufficient. And, you know, one of the things I'm probably most proud about that we're doing right now is that we open access to behavioral health appointments 
um, within two days. So our average waiting time right now uh, is less than two days for anybody in the country to get access to care. And that includes uh, complex psychiatry too, which most of the new behavioral health platforms don't do psychiatry. They just do cognitive behavioral therapy. So, you know, thinking back to my, my little brother, Zach, and sort of his experience and the things I would have loved to have said to him and the tools I would have loved to have put around him, also super inspiring for the kind of work and care that we're delivering here. There is still this trope um, that that can be so false that it's kids who are outcasts or um, or bullied or you know all of these things yeah. only or, or primarily who struggle. And I, I did read up on uh, that tragic situation um, with your brother and how the boarding school uh, that I believe both of you attended responded. Yeah. And at the time. Um, it was, it was, seems like it was a first for them in the way that they thought about the situation. And he was such a leader and so loved there that, yeah. um, it, it was a, a huge traumatic moment for the campus where they even pulled back on testing and, and really, um, allowed people to mourn and focus in on the moment, which is very much, a lot of institutions are still struggling to do that with uh, the the tragic incidents that we have now, but th there's something in that about all kinds of people having struggle, needing to communicate, needing to take care of, of mental health issues that, uh, that really uh, impacted me reading that story. Yeah, well, thanks for saying it. Yeah, the, the boarding school was Phillips Academy, better known as Andover, and and um, I'm a proud alum, and he loved that school too. And he was the president of the student body there, which uh, I think to be the, you know, sort of elected by your classmates in any school is a big deal, but for a school that size and of that sort of um, visibility and prestige, if you will, I think it was a really big deal. And, you know, he would regularly meet with uh, former presidents at trustee meetings, and it was sort of a big job. And I think he took it very seriously. Um, you know, the, a little bit more about that story is he got um, he got caught drinking on campus, and that was sort of a triggering event for him that he felt like he had let down the entire campus. Um, what I think, again, most people would agree to is we all make a bunch of mistakes when we're in high school, and there was not a quick sort of um, net to catch him to say, hey, this buddy, this is like one of those things that we all, frankly, probably most of us did. And uh, and even if you got caught, you were not going to be marked uh, that way for the rest of your life. But I think in high school, uh, we lose perspective on that. And I, I, I also admired the way that the school responded. I, I came back and gave a talk. There was recently another death on campus that was very similar. And I came back uh, and met with students um, during that time frame as well. And I'm, I'm very proud of sort of how communities like that have really pushed themselves to address this issue. But, but one thing I'll say while we're on the topic, and it is the holidays, so this tends to be a time when people actually feel a lot of loneliness. You know, a lot of leaders don't talk about this either, John. And you're in the business every day, whether this, uh, uh, you know, this, um, you know, platform or your other platforms on CNBC, you're talking to CEOs. And a lot of people, I think, assume that these people and other executives in companies are total world beaters. They don't have a care in the world. How could they? They seem to be masters of their own universe. Now, the reality is, I think a lot of those people struggle and don't talk about it. And that's one of the things that I've been sort of concerned about in my backyard here in Silicon Valley. Um, and, and, you know, while I think a lot of people are struggling generally, it's, a sometimes it's the communities that, uh, are, are the ones that feel like they can talk about it the least because more is expected of them that we should really be paying attention to. Very true. Whether it's early stage startup founders and CEOs who feel like it's a version of the fake it till you make it, where there's a yep. certain amount of belief that you have to put forward to keep your team going when things are tough or when that funding hasn't come through, you have to present the best story right. to the investors in order for them to want to invest. Because if you show how you're really feeling, then, you know, you, you you're can't toast. Do that. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, you're toast. And then there's the piece that's this Instagram and TikTok generation where it's your best version of yourself. Not only that, but filtered that you're putting out there. You're not talking about what's got you depressed because that doesn't get clicks. Right. Um, so, it's like everybody's becoming CEO, CEO-ified. 
I, I, you know, I, I haven't heard that phrase, but I think it's true. It's a, it's, it's a weirdly, uh, it's a weird moment because we all want to be looked at in a certain sense. And, but, but, but inside, I think most people don't actually feel, well, I don't want to say most people, many, many folks I worry, uh, haven't been connected with authentically in a long time. Nobody's really said, how are you actually really doing? Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, I've encouraged in my board meetings from time to time, and I, <laughs> I will say my board members get uncomfortable when I do this, is a check-in. Like, how are we doing? What's on your mind today? We're going to take 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever is necessary to share a little bit about what's going on in our personal life. I, ta- I do that at every single one of my executive staff meetings. And um, there's a reason for that. Uh, and it's it, it's a personal one. I'm personally committed to it, given the the story that we just talked through. But there's a practical reason too, because I think if people show up to those interactions, and there's something blocking them from fully participating because something's on their mind, well, let's get past it, or let's talk about it, or at least let's at least sort of understand that that's where that person is before trying to move on to you know our ops review or or looking at any number of dashboards that we might normally do. Uh, I think these are important practices. I think in Silicon Valley, we're just starting to talk about them, but uh, but but it is going to take, as you pointed out, um, a little bit of a, a willingness to to admit that we don't have everything figured out all the time. Yeah, normalize it. Uh, yeah, I think is is part of it. We've normalized failure in striving, but we haven't normalized imperfection. I think quite as much. As we could. Well, I, w- I want to say something about the failure thing, because this is actually you're right. And, and, and as with everything, you're super sort of tapped into how people in this part of the world think. But but I don't think we've actually normalized failure. The failure story we love to tell is when somebody didn't succeed at something and then did something heroic the next time. That's the failure story we love. Or it's the second coming of Steve Jobs. Right. Those are the those are the moments that that sort of allow us to quickly say fail fast and learn and those sorts of things. But the reality is that if you are somebody who uh, wants to put yourself out there and be, being an entrepreneur and trying to go be the one man, one woman band and get people interested in what you're doing, you're putting yourself out there in this incredible way. And if it doesn't work, which it does not work for the majority of entrepreneurial efforts, uh, unless you have something that goes better the next time, I don't think you get that, oh, well, I failed, but I learned sort of experience. I think that that's a bit of a myth. Yeah, um, we still got work to do for sure. Um, tell me about Stanford and you know, along your trajectory as you're pursuing uh, technology, technical knowledge, making connections, what you got from that experience? Yeah, well, it's an amazing place. I mean, I I, I don't think that it has been uh, overbuilt or overhyped. I think they are right where uh, they deserve to be in terms of people's eyes and views. Part of it is, and, and I'm sure you've had lots of opportunities to spend time there. Part of it is just sort of the openness and the dynamic of the campus. It's nestled in this sort of beautiful uh, part of California, just underneath the the foothills and um, there is an openness to the campus and the design that I think encourages learning across engineering and medicine uh, and business. You know, I co-founded this business with uh, a professor in the medical school who also was interested in engineering. Uh, I was interested in in business, but I was also taking classes in mechanical and engineering design. Um, so uh, there's just that sort of like uh, experience of, of the whole campus that I think is important. I think the second thing that's really, really powerful is there's a real desire for experimentation. So to connect this to the last thing we were talking about, you can experiment very safely there. You can take a shot at something through an academic project or something on the side, and it may not work, but you're within the broader tent of a school that that encourages that sort of thinking. Um, one of my favorite things was that uh, with um, three other people, uh, that I was with at Stanford, we started a, a podcast series where we would uh, grab, this is, I mean, this just, just for people's reference, this was podcasting in like 2007 and eight. So this is way before it became a real thing. And and our, our gig was, and you, I think you'll get a kick out of this, people would come on campus and we would just, you know, grab them right after class and say, can, can, you, can you talk to us for 10 minutes? And we'd record them uh, by putting a microphone in their face. And, and that was how we got, you know, Eric Schmidt and Steve Jobs and Craig Newmark and all these 
absolute sort of um, you know makers and builders and, and trendsetters at the time to to join us on this podcast, and we built an audience that way. But that was a I never would have taken a shot at that if if I didn't have sort of the institutional platform to know that you know it was worth the experimentation. And the worst thing that would happen if I failed was I would have lost some time and 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 maybe maybe made a little bit of a fool of myself. Now, given what we talked about so far, I can have some, I can make some guesses, but what, what brought you to co-found reputation.com? Um, because we've been talking about health. We've been talking about technology. We've in a way been talking about the impact of self image and reputation on health. Um, but, but how did that come together and what did you intend? Yeah, I think if I let you go first on that question, you would have a lot of the right theories. Um, you know, it was around that same time frame, actually, 2008, um, where it really started to become clear to me and my co-founders there that the way that people showed up online um, was going to haunt them for the rest of their lives. And our initial interest in product in that company was actually in kids getting bullied. So that part wouldn't surprise you at all. Um, you know, this was when you would have uh, an inappropriate photo posted online. Kids were getting outed for their sexual preference or, or, or gender identity, and um, their whole life would be ruined. They, they would, you know, go sort of in the, in the past up until that point, maybe a note was passed in class, something written on the bathroom wall that was inappropriate. But the, it was sort of like exponential bullying and knowledge of one's experience uh, overnight. And we knew that that needed to stop. And we didn't have a, a way in that moment of contacting the platforms to say this is really hurtful speech and inappropriate. Um, much of the conversation in the ensuing decade has really been about how to think about what sort of speech is private online, what sorts of photos are online. Unfortunately, that that debate still rages today. And but that's context, where we started it. For, for context, if I if I remember correctly, because this is around the time when I left the San Jose Mercury News, I remember I was commuting up to uh, San Francisco for Business 2.0 and Fortune Magazine by train, um, th there were a number of teen suicides around that time yeah. in Palo Alto, right as part of the Stanford community that um, that were very similar to the di dynamic that we've been talking about. High achieving environment, not always kids who had been bullied, but sometimes they were just having a difficult time in one particular area didn't feel like they could talk about it. Maybe some of it was digitally related and that. The, the, I would say the whole country was experiencing that, but your, your memory is right. And unfortunately it was sort of the, the, the Caltrain rail there that you and I are both familiar with became sort of ground zero for um, uh, a lot of, a lot of tragedy. Um, and, you know, again, sort of looping back to some stuff we've talked about, it's sort of that loss of perspective, but if we could provide a technology tool, that would allow people to a monitor. So it sort of really was just about like understanding and having visibility to these things and then be remediate uh, the sorts of things that would be damaging and hurtful, that that was going to be really, really important. And, you know, the technology side of this too was super appealing to me. So my background at eBay and PayPal had been in data science, I started the first data science team at, at eBay. And this is before that term actually was sort of widely used. And it was all about using sort of high high throughput, high streaming uh, transactional information to make more sense of the world. I thought it would be interesting to try to help people explore questions of reputation and privacy online as well. And lo and behold, those remain really, really important concerns for people because um, you know your your resume is one thing now, but the reality is uh, it's how how I encounter uh, your name in Google search results. And a variety of social media platforms that really describes you know my first impression of you and and that was something that was deeply interesting and remains deeply interesting to me how did the reputation.com part of your professional journey end yeah so the company so i did it for let me think about this i did it for a little over five years i was the chief operating officer of that company um, worked with a terrific uh, group of technologists and partners. The business really started to transition towards um, a different form of uh, reputation defense uh, around sort of high profile stuff that I think was um, uh, interesting. It was a good business. Uh, it wasn't as uh, personally inspiring to me. 
um, as what we had started with. Um, it, it, it was admittedly the better and bigger business. And, um, and it was a good time for me to think about uh, starting something next. And so had a conversation with the board, with my co-founders, and, um, and then took, uh, you know, the better part of a year to, to set the stage for what would come with this business, um, which was really closer to home with my personal inspiration. I mean, I think you're seeing a bit of a through line. It's really about how do you think about people and take care of people at scale? Um, and, um, you know, questions of where society threatens the way we live or where there just isn't a good safeguard or good application of human first technologies. That's where I get really, really motivated. How did you start it? So I alluded to this um, awesome guy. His name's Dr. Rusty Hoffman. He's still at Stanford. If you are somebody who suffers from DVT, these are the blood clots that can uh, form in your veins, um, most notably your leg. Uh, there's not a better person in the world to take care of you. And I say that uh, because uh, I've seen him in action. He's both a great surgeon and a, and a great human being. And he was interested actually in the other side of this equation. So. I was looking at an American healthcare system that didn't know how to connect expertise to individuals. He was looking at it from the perspective initially as an expert who uh, wanted to sort of broadcast his expertise well beyond the, the immediate Stanford area. Now, there was also a personal story, which you may have encountered in your research on this, which is that Russie's um, young kid, I don't know how old your kids are, John, but, but his kids... Um, a little older than mine, but at the time, um, his youngest uh, developed a, uh, a life-threatening condition that Stanford actually didn't have the treatment for, at least not at the time. And so Rusty went and encountered a paper that hadn't been published yet using his connections by a researcher in Seattle. And that was actually the treatment methodology that would give his kids life uh, back. And so, you know, I'll get the numbers wrong, uh, precisely, but it was closely like, it was close to a 70% fatality expectation or mortality expectation in year one, uh, of this condition. And so it was very, very serious. Now I'm super proud to report that, uh, Grady is his name is, uh, um, uh, a new student at the Stanford medical school or will be a new student at the Stanford medical school. So it's pretty amazing story. Um, and, that was very motivating for us for how we wanted to connect a lot more people into care because it turns out that that story actually is highly replicable not in all cases i don't want to promise miracle cures but in many many cases the access or the secret to a better form of treatment may lie beyond your immediate hospital it might be in some experts team or some experts research work and it's just about connecting it i'll give you sort of a a sobering statistic about this, 67% of our expert medical opinions, so these are where we take a, a case and we bring it to an expert, uh, result in a, in a material change in diagnosis or treatment. So that just gives you a real sense that for people who actually tap into expertise, that they might get a radically different form of care. That was certainly uh, the case in the Hoffman family. It was the case for me. Um, uh, a little bit later on, and, and it uh, is the case for millions and millions of Americans who, who access these sorts of services. And I'll never miss an opportunity to name drop uh, other Fort Knox alums, as I like to call you guys. Uh, Michelle Longmire over at Medible is trying to make access to clinical trials more broadly available to communities that don't live right near these right. research institutions. So in a way, uh, trying to scale that similar sort of effect that you talked about. What was the path to finding funding? Did the reputation.com experience and the Stanford connection, I, I imagine those helped? Uh, it helped. I mean, I think, I think to your point, the, the, you know, the whole um, second time or third time founder, that is, a, that, is a, that is a pattern that the venture investing community likes to get behind with good reason. It, it seems to produce good results because you don't make the same boneheaded mistakes the second or third time around. Um, I had been close to the venture firm that ultimately led our um, large uh, first investment here. Um, they're Venrock and they are outstanding in healthcare. I was close to our second investor, which was 
excuse me, which was Greylock, uh, very skilled in consumer and enterprise. Um, and so it did help to have those connections. I think you're right. But I think even more than that, what those investors saw and the investors that would follow was that there was a huge opportunity here, that this was sort of one of those markets that had yet to transform with technology and they wanted to be a part of it. Some of them were deeply knowledgeable about healthcare. I would say the Venrock guys really knew, understood how healthcare worked. Some were more knowledgeable about how software worked, um, uh, like the Greylock team, uh, like the General Atlantic team that we now work with. Um, but but it was really that combination um, that made it possible. There's uh, an experience I like to ask about. I, I call it Death Valley, a lowest point, because I think there's a lot to learn from how one gets through that. And we've already talked about a lot of tough stuff. I'm going to be more specific here and ask from a professional point of view on the trajectory of these companies, entrepreneurship, management, leadership. What has that been for you? Um, maybe a moment where you thought, maybe this is all falling apart. It's not going to work. Yeah. I mean, um, I, well, uh, I don't want to dispirit your audience by saying those those things um, are very frequent um, and they're frequent even for highly scaled companies. So this this business, you know, nobody reports exactly the size of, of private digital health companies, but um, I've got to believe in revenue, covered lives, um, total experiences, visits. We're one of the largest um, private digital health companies that's out there. So a lot of people look at companies like mine and say, you know, you must have figured it all out. But the reality is we're sort of constantly trying to push ourselves and push the platform. And that leads to those Death Valley moments. Um, they're more acute at the beginning. So let me give you one. So I, I was talking to you a little bit about how Rusty and I teamed up in the very beginning. Well, it turned out that simply having uh, access to these terrific experts, I think it was a couple hundred in the early days, um, didn't actually mean that members wanted to engage. Uh, and so one of the interesting things was we actually started as a consumer business and, you know, it was it was like my mom and her friends would use the tool, but I couldn't get anybody to get interested in this. And and so the sort of pivot moment, which was post the Death Valley moment, was figuring out that it was really businesses that had a much larger stake in the quality of the health benefits that they provided and people getting better care. And that most consumers are not accustomed to paying for care in this way. Um, and so that was a real change. I mean, it's also worth mentioning, you know, stuff that's happened uh, in the most more recent past, which was going through that Silicon Valley uh, bank moment of recognizing that, um, you know, you have your assets with uh, an amazing institution and, um, you know, entrepreneurs, we, we are prepared for and have resilience towards any number of regular business challenges, uh, expecting all of your cash to go away because your bank is insolvent is not one of those things that we prepare for in our boot camp. So that was another sort of big moment for us. Um, but there, there have been hundreds along the way. So go back, tell me a little bit more about this pivot. And um, you, you say the pivot happened after the Death Valley moment. When your initial model didn't work, how badly did it not work? Like what? What did you? I mean, did it you didn't have to, work. We did you we have had, to downsize. We, did you have to? What did you have to do? Well, so the interesting thing on that one was we didn't actually have. Uh, I, I can give you sort of one that happened later that that had probably more impact on the people here. But at the, the particular moment that I'm describing, we didn't really have a huge team, so there wasn't there wasn't that sort of like oh we've got to go through and, and tell people sorry it's over for you here. Um, but it was a it was the more existential staring into the void and saying did did we just get it wrong? Like, is this not actually a product or service that anybody really cares about? You know, would we be better suited to, uh, you know, return money to our investors, uh, dust up our resumes and, and go back on the street and see who might be interested? And I definitely had those moments. I mean, I, I, I told my wife at one point to uh, always remember, um, and I do write in a piece of paper and, uh, and lock it up to never let me start something again because of that emotional roller coaster you go through that you're going to fail yourself and you're going to fail a bunch of people around you. Now, having said that, all of us, I think, pathologically have short memories on these things. And and so I would definitely start another company again in the future because it's uh, it's it's there's no better way to sort of um, see human innovation come to life and, and work with exceptional people to to do really cool things. But 
that was the that was a first um, scary moment for sure. How did you get from this isn't working to maybe this way will work? Um, it was that insight that I shared with you. It was really understanding that um, large employers uh, had a huge stake in all of this. That but where did that come from? Where did that insight come from? Oh, uh, it just honestly talking to people about. I mean, initially it was, hey will you pay for this expert medical opinion? Would you put your credit card down, buy it like an e-commerce experience? And when people said, no, I, you know, I, I can't do that. Can the government pay for it? Can, can my employer pay for it? We, we started to pull on that sweater thread to understand how employers would pay for things. Now, in our naivete, we didn't understand that employers don't actually supply a credit card and let people uh, buy, uh, buy the drink online with their benefits, but that there are ways to structure broad programs that are uh, that sit alongside your health insurance, your vision insurance, and other things that allow people to tap into those sorts of benefits. And then we discovered, and this was sort of, um, you know, aha number two, that they wouldn't just pay whatever the retail value of that was. I mean, we, we could say, well, here's our, here are our costs. We'd like to make this margin. This is what we think it should cost. They actually want to pay for the value that you're returning to the business. And this is where the sort of math of our business ended up being really important. So your employer, actually, uh, we haven't even talked about this. Your employer has access to the very same program that I'm talking about. And the interesting thing in proving it to those guys who are among the smartest in the business was that they wanted to make sure that there were amazing sort of clinical and health benefits to each person who used it, A, but B, and equally importantly, that as we did all of those experiences, that that 67% change rate that I described earlier, that that translated into savings that were addressable and usable by the overall health plan. And that was a really important dynamic to understand that there was actually a real business model. And John, what I would tell you is that while it hasn't been sort of perfectly up into the right since then, unlocking that sort of thinking making it such that we can measure the impact of every interaction to the member and to the person who is paying for it to so the, the company that was a real wow moment and that's what's allowed us to you know as i mentioned now sell to over over 30 percent of the fortune 500. i i tend to find that whatever gets one through these death valley moments becomes a core belief a tool in the toolbox that you can then continue to use so maybe trying to tie all these threads together a bit. We talked about pressure and resilience uh, at a personal level. We've talked about it at a professional level. You say that these Death Valley moments are frequent. What's your process for aiding your natural resilience, for dealing with these things in a healthy way while continuing to be functional in your professional role? Are there people who you talk to is there a level of, of transparency that you have to check with yourself to make sure that you're sharing about these things early enough? What do you do? Yeah, these are great questions. I think that, uh, well, a couple of things. I mean, I actually want to see if, 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 if you're open to it, I'll build on your framework a little bit about the Death Valley moment becomes a core belief or, or a, a central truth. I would say that we actually had that heading into that moment. Uh, we probably hadn't written it down as clearly as we have subsequently. And it's been conviction that's powered us through a bunch of things, which is that you always have to put the member first. So you have to make sure that you're taking care of the member or the patient with everything you do. Um, I, I mention that because around that same time frame, a lot of the, the dollars that were offered to us for services uh, to be provided were, could we cover a select number of executives? Could we provide a high-end concierge service a perk, if you will, for certain leaders within organizations. Um, and that wasn't interesting to us at all, because if we're trying to do this for everybody, you can't cherry pick the people who probably enjoy the best access to start with. Um, so we really had a problem with that. And it was a it was a scary moment. It wouldn't be scary to sort of hold to that principle now, but it was a scary moment then because we had no revenue and we were worried we were going to go out of the business, go out of business. But I think people follow that central set of principles. This allows me to answer the second part of your question, which is what upholds, you know, or what sort of uh, keeps my conviction, keeps the fire going when you're going through those death valley moments, as you call it. Um, and it's pretty simple, which is what we do actually really matters to a whole bunch of people who I probably will never meet and they'll never meet me and they don't know who I am. I hope they don't know who I am. 
Um, and yet I have a couple of tools, one sitting right below our window as we talk, John, that allow me to tune into a stream of anonymized interactions with our patients to see the type of impact that we're having all across the country, to see verbatim feedback, to see star ratings, to see clinical outcomes, to see the healthy days that we're generating, which is a standard metric we use. That data is very fulfilling for me. And so on a dark day when I'm like, well, man, is the business going to be worth as much as I thought it was going to be or um, you know, any number of sort of uh, CEO strategic questions, I can tune into that and I'm reminded of exactly why we're doing and why we're doing what we're doing. And for me, this probably wouldn't work for every CEO, but for me, and I think you've figured a lot of this out in my background, that is deeply satisfying. And I would hope that most people I work with and most of the people we take care of really understand that that's the way the whole team thinks about the opportunity here. And, um, and it's allowed us to get as far as we are and it's gonna probably take us to that next two, three, four levels that we have planned out for ourselves. That tells me what motivates you to work through the pain. It doesn't tell me what allows you to both experience and deal with your pain and be there for the people outside of the professional context who need you, uh, yeah. even in those moments when you're feeling pain. So what about that part? How do you? Yeah, it's I mean, look, it's. Um... It's interesting. I don't know if you've had guests on uh, your show talking about transparency. I, I think that you mentioned that word. I think it can cut both ways. I don't uh, I, I want to make sure that everybody here on my team, which is now, you know, a few thousand people understands why we're doing what we're doing and sort of what powers my decision making and the decision making of the leaders that are visible to them. And yet, I don't think that most people are really interested in uh, getting a stream of conscience from me all the time about uh, sort of the challenges. In fact, I think that's not uh, that's not really useful to 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 most people. So for me personally, there are some things I invest in in myself outside of the business. Probably the best one, um, and and this is uh, no secret to I'm sure a lot of your viewers is is the YPO organization, which brings together. Uh, young leaders of organizations, and it has uh, has a highly, highly confidential way of sharing experience. Um, you know, I my group here in San Francisco is an absolutely incredible group of leaders um, running world changing organizations, and I think the time that we spend with each other, uh, which is about a day a month, I'm sorry, yeah, about a day a month, uh, allows us to sort of like have that sharing experience and bounce ideas other uh, off of other CEOs. So I, I recommend those sorts of um, workshops and opportunities for other people. All right. Yeah, I think that's so important uh, to hear from leaders that, that that's important to you as well. So uh, circling back now to Included Health itself, as we head into 2024, what's the strategic priority? Yeah. So um, we're living in a really fun time because all those dimensions that we talked about, about how people want to experience care and what they tell us about what they like about what we're doing. The real goal for us is to continue to simplify and integrate more of that experience. So we're looking at, we've integrated primary care with navigation. So we make using your benefits easier. And at the same time, uh, have a primary care team that is supercharged with that knowledge that for us, as we look forward, I'm really in, interested in integrating the other forms of experience people have. So how they experience in-person care how they experience things like surgery, how they experience pharmacy, right? So we guide all of those decisions today, but we're really interested in opportunities to drive the included health brand of experience more deeply into all of that. You know, one of the fun things about my job, really fun, gets me jumping out of bed every day, even on those dark days, is there's never a lack of stuff to do. There are always interesting ways to think about the problem and address more of that experiential gap that has led to so many Americans opting out of care entirely. So those are three areas that we're really thinking about. We head into a, a new year where we see a lot of opportunity. We're psyched to be onboarding these large clients to being able to offer the kind of experience that we've built for more and more people. Um, but I wanna now deepen that experience for them too. All right. Oh, and trip. Um, it, it's an important area that, that all of us uh, need to experience in the best way possible. Thanks for sharing with me about Included Health and about your own personal journey. You got it. 
Nice to see you.